So thank you much, uh, very much for coming here. I do apologize for those of you who saw that the title of the talk was Slow Search and thought, oh good, I have to go there because Jamie's going to tell me about how to make search faster. Because as Michael mentioned, I'm not here to actually get rid of Slow Search. I'm here to advocate on behalf of it. So in the 20 years that I've been trying to study and understand and support search, slow and search are never used together in a positive way. Um, and I, uh, but really a lot of the things that kind of what I've been looking at as I study how people interact with external information resources to find things has shown that search is a really fascinating, rich, and complex process. So for example, uh, your two or three word query that you typically give to a search engine isn't nearly enough to express what uh, most information needs. Maybe if you're looking for Facebook, it's enough, but if you want to understand a medical condition or if you want to plan a vacation, um, it's just too little. So I started out thinking a fair amount about how we can use context to understand uh, what people are looking for when, when they give a short two or three word query. And uh, that led to a whole area of research within personalized search. Um, actually developed the first algorithm that Bing uses to personalize search results. But what became evident as we were doing that is that our, um, much more than just an individual query in search results, people are thinking a lot more about uh, large complex tasks. And that's where slow search comes in, trying to think about how to support these more complex tasks. Uh, slow search builds on a series of slow movements. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the slow food movement that advocates for taking more time to prepare and enjoy food so that you connect more with what you're consuming. But there's actually other slow movements that I think are pretty fun too. Uh, one is the slow parenting movement. And uh, the idea behind the slow parenting movement is that we're not trying to raise our children just to be grown-ups as uh, fast as possible, but instead we should step back and think a little bit about uh, you know, just capturing and enjoying childhood for what it is and not for where you're going. Um, and I talk about slow parenting partly as an excuse to show my four cute boys. <laughs> Uh, another slow movement that I think is pretty interesting is the slow science movement. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with the pressure to sort of, um, you know, publish soon or meet the next deadline. Slow science advocates that uh, advocates say we should be thinking more about what's what's going to impact the world five years or ten years or even longer down the line, even if that comes at the expense of short-term uh, productivity. Uh, so slow search builds on the ideas behind these various slow movements. And there's a handful of ways that you could imagine including time into the search process. One is to help the searcher slow down and think a little bit about what they're doing as they, as they search. So maybe you learn as you're searching. Maybe you encounter serendipitous information as you're searching. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but I'm actually going to focus on a second aspect of slow search in this talk today. And that's thinking about algorithmically, what might we do if we had more time to produce search results uh, for people? Uh, because search engines haven't ever really done this. Instead, what search engines do is they're focused on getting search results to people as fast as humanly possible. And there's a really good reason for that. Uh, study after study has shown that when people get search results just a little bit slower, they think that they're a lot worse. Uh, so both, uh, both our research at Bing and uh, research that's been done at Google has shown that if you slow search results by even just a couple hundred milliseconds, you're going to decrease the experience that people have. Um, so the way that we run these experiments is we'll take a query that you've issued. And normally, when a search engine gets a query, it races as fast as it can to throw the search results back out at people. Uh, in these experiments, what we did instead is we get your query, and then we hold on to it for a fraction of a second. So we might hold on to your query for 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, and then we'll give you your search results, the same search results that we would give you if we didn't hold on to it. And even though people can't actually notice a couple hundred milliseconds, it's basically imperceptible to people. When we do that, the people with their search results will go and interact less with the search results. They click fewer results. They abandon their query more. They issue fewer queries. And, and those changes actually persist over time. So we see that even if we stop holding on to your search results by a couple hundred milliseconds, next week you're searching less. 
So there's this real strong incentive to getting people results as fast as possible, and search engines invest a ton of resources and a ton of effort and a ton of time into doing that. Uh, one example is we uh, assume term independence so that we don't have to think of all of the different possible ways uh, that content relates to each other. We also do a lot of, invest a lot in caching. Um, there's even some more obvious changes that you might have seen. Um, how many people know that Google changed their logo recently? Yeah, do you like the new logo better? Yeah, it's ugly, right? <laughs> but you know what's good about it? It's made entirely out of vectors. It loads really fast. It's a lot smaller than the old logo. And so their search result page will load that much faster, even you know, 50 milliseconds faster in your experience searching. You'll think that Google actually has better search results. Uh, even changes that are designed um, that seem sort of unambiguously good end up being bad if they slow down your search experience. So um, another example, this is another one by Google, is they actually ran this experiment where they decided to give people 20 search results instead of 10 search results in response to a query. And this makes kind of logical sense when you think about the fact that nobody ever clicks on the second search result page. Nobody ever, ever, ever clicks on the like next search result page. And you know, that's a shame because when you look at the relevance of search results, the first couple search results t tends to be like those results ranked one or two are very likely to be relevant. But by the time you're getting to like the fifth result, it's still likely to be relevant, but the fifth result and the 15th result are about the same likeliness of being relevant. So there's lots of good relevant content on that second page that you don't ever see because you're not clicking on that next search result page. So Google figured, okay, we'll give you 20 results instead of 10. There's no way that we're gonna be harming anything there. And yet when they did that, all of their metrics went through the floor. They were just a mess. They clearly had screwed things up. And what happened was giving those 20 results caused the page to load slower and people stopped clicking on things and stopped um, actually interacting with the search results. So if you go to Bing now, we've learned from these sort of experiments and we actually only give you eight search results the first time you search. And that actually makes a big difference. We don't start giving people 10 results or even 14 or 15 results until we know you're actually engaged in that search and wanna, and wanna do more. Of course, please. So, uh, why not just give five results or two results? Yeah, so we actually played around with this. Um, some of, actually, this is the personalization work that I did. One of the things that we did was we figured out, Michael mentioned refining, we figured out when people are repeating queries and we have a certain knowledge about what it is, we can know with more or less 100% accuracy exactly what you're gonna click on, that's one result. And actually, we can give you one result and we can give you a lot of useful information with that result. We can give you deep links, we can give you, we can show you the new content on that page, we can do all sorts of good things, you know. Um, and when we flighted that, people hated it. It was, you know, we sort of had these hero results and that was just because you're expecting to see a bunch of results. Um, I think we might, now that people are getting more comfortable and familiar with things like answers, it might do better. And actually, I've, we've started doing things where we're showing one result maybe in a little bit larger text, or so you might have that, but you still wanna have people feel kind of uncomfortable. It, it's sort of like the I'm feeling lucky button, which Google has that nobody ever clicks on. They have it more for branding purposes. Um, it's just you have to, you don't, people don't like to be sort of thrown out there with nothing. Um, I think actually, and also in these voice interfaces, we start thinking about mobile interactions too. We're gonna see more, um, there's more trust, different interactions, but not yet. <laughs> the trade-off of time is, is more complicated than when you have less information. Yeah, so like um, with Bing, we managed to get away with showing eight results because nobody knows that it's eight results. You're not sitting there counting. We can do that and nobody knows. If we get down to like three results, then you're gonna, I think as long as we show pretty much everything that was above the fold before, then we'd be good. I think once we, um, you know, so maybe we could do seven um, and that might be worthwhile. And actually what we do too then, and, and I might touch on this um, some later, when you click on a result, and you come back to the page, then we know you're engaged and interested in that page, so then we might show you 15 results or even more. Um, so it's something fun, like go play around with search engines and count the number of links that you're seeing. Um, you know, well, and then there's this real irony too, so get kind of actually this, this leads right into what I was, where I was going, where there's this real irony that when you're searching, the fact that 100 milliseconds matters 
is crazy when you think about the fact that we spend all this time on a search engine. So if you're going to Facebook and you just typed in Facebook and you want to go and jump and do a navigational query, it makes sense that you that you know a couple hundred milliseconds might slow you down. But if you're trying to research a new diagnosis or you're planning a vacation or you're doing something more involved, 100 milliseconds is nothing. Over half of the time that you spend on a search engine is actually involved in multi-query sessions. Um, and that kind of makes sense. So it doesn't mean that it's half of your sessions. This is half of your time. You may go to a search engine 10 times. Nine of those times might be navigational where you're going just to Facebook. One of those times is you research in your vacation where you go spend a half an hour. So those nine, those nine queries don't really, uh, for Facebook don't really count. Yeah? Could it be that if you actually made the search results better in those 100 milliseconds rather than just artificially creating the delay, then over time you wouldn't see the effect of people interacting less with it. If you, you made, that if you made the results like, proportionally better, sense. if you actually use that time to make the results better, then could you avoid that fail? Yeah, and so that's what we're going to start exploring. Um, and I think that's a really good question that you have there. Yeah. <coughs> Um, and there's actually ways that you can start doing this even, you know, there's ways that we can take more time without um, making people wait as well. So we know that people involved half the time in these long search sessions and many of these search sessions actually extend across multiple sessions as well. So you might start searching for your vacation to Hawaii and you're going to return and search for it again later in a few days. And we can do a really good job. We've found that we're able to predict when people are going to return to a search task pretty accurately. So we could go in between those two sessions and spend a, a, not even just 100 milliseconds, we could go spend five minutes trying to figure out the best um, content for you there and show it to you when you're ready. So there's a number of ways that we can start, even if people hate waiting 100 milliseconds, there's a number of ways that we can start thinking about incorporating uh, additional information in addition to t teaching them to actually be a little patient and wait. And we know people can be patient and wait because we see it in practice. And a place where we see it in practice is when we ask questions of other people. So as much as we think of search engines as a way of finding information, it's uh, actually not the way that we find information most of the time. Most of the time we ask other people. And when our asking is electronically mediated, like we email somebody or we're going to ask on Facebook or post to Twitter or post to Quora, when that happens, uh, we, it's, it's always asynchronous. And there's no way that I would expect to say, hey, friends, where should I eat in Palo Alto tonight? and get a result within half a second. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, so social search and question asking is a really good place for us to start learning some lessons um, about slow search or the slow search experience. And we also all experience slow search in our daily lives right now. We just call it mobile search because, you know, going over the uh, cellular tower to get information is really slow. It takes a longer time. And we actually see different search behavior from mobile devices because it's slower. Um, we, there, there's also interesting work happening in sort of low connectivity environments, um, you know, in developing uh, communities where people don't necessarily have access. And, and there you think a lot more about like maybe how you give a rich explanation of what you're looking for and how search engines can take more time to find, uh, find content. Another example that I like, um, and it's actually kind of, I used to give this as a crazy example, and this may be becoming a little bit more realistic, but when you think of searching from outer space, there's inherent limitations into how fast information can travel. So when Elon Musk puts people on Mars, and those Martians want to search Earth databases, it's going to take 25 minutes for the light to travel from Mars to Earth and back again. So there's no way we can provide search of Earth databases faster than 25 minutes. So taking an extra couple minutes to do better job finding good results uh, makes sense. Uh, the question is, of course, if you're going to take uh, extra time, whether it's an extra five minutes because a query is coming from Mars, or an extra 100 milliseconds because we just have figured out how to help people wait a little bit longer, it's hard to figure out how to use that extra time. And if when and I've had this conversation with you know a bunch of people who do uh, information retrieval research, none of us really know what we would do. You know, what, what, what would you do? Maybe you would start trying out a bunch of different alternatives. So one thing that people like to do is expand queries and try different ways of phrasing what people are looking for so that they can retrieve more. We could do things like that. We could do more post-processing of information. 
Um, another thing that's really interesting if you have more time is to think about load balancing. So when Michael Jackson died five years ago, that was, I remember that because that was just one of the first instances where Bing really had a huge spike in traffic all of a sudden through the roof. And the interesting thing is we need to be, we need to have the servers available to always be handling sort of Michael Jackson dies level traffic when most of the time it's kind of boring and it's like, oh, what's my morning commute to work like? Uh, and if we could load balance a little bit better because we could get people to wait, we, that would be another way to... Um, make use of slow search. And then finally, one, one way that I think is particularly interesting for um, slow search is thinking about making use of inherently slow resources. So we can include people in the search process, as much as we do with question asking. When we ask people, that's inherently slow. We can go out and actively crawl content. Web content changes a lot. I spoke here a couple years ago about some of the work we've done looking at dynamic uh, web content. And you can go out and crawl that and, and, and get more information. I'm going to focus right now on thinking about uh, how we can incorporate other people in the search process. There's a bunch of different kinds of people you can think about, um, including yourself. How does a person interact individually and help themselves search? How do our friends help us search, which we do with sort of question asking and social search? And also, how do crowd workers uh, how can we use uh, crowd workers to help us search? I'm going to start with thinking about crowdsourcing. Um, and the reason that I'm going to start with crowdsourcing is because in some ways they're the most straightforward. We completely get rid of the issue of motivation because we're going to, I'm talking about paid crowdsourcing here. Um, we're going to pay people. And also what's fun about crowdsourcing is it allows us to Wizard of Oz some um, some uh, slow search experiences. So there may be things that we could eventually do algorithmically, but that are just too hard. And by uh, integrating crowd workers into the process, we can figure out whether they're worth fighting for and pushing for and figuring out how to, um, how to do. Uh, so when we thought about how we might incorporate crowdsourcing into search, we basically thought, well, let's look at the different components that are in search and think about which one of those would be uh, good for replacing with people. So kind of at a um, rough, in a, a really rough overview of thinking about the search process, there's four, there's three steps. One, you get the query and you have to understand the query. You have to understand what a person's looking for and know more about that. Second step, you have to go retrieve documents, go retrieve information to give to a person in response to their query. And then the third step is you have to understand the content and help present it to the uh, person who's searching in a way that makes sense to them. Machines are really good at operating at scale, which means they're really good at retrieving content, taking some sort of representation and matching it to a large corpus of other representations. That's something that we can't do. It would be a pain in the butt if I asked you to go search one billion, one trillion web pages to find which ones had the word dog on it. On the other hand, people are really good at understanding things, so understanding queries and understanding results. And so the first thing that we tried to do was just take some of these algorithms that we had written for, um, for uh, information retrieval and say, OK, we're, maybe we're just not doing well enough at these. Uh, you know, Maybe we just need higher accuracy in these uh, kind of IR components, and let's replace them with people where we can get better accuracy. So one example is um, in information retrieval, we do a lot of work on query expansion, where we try and take a query and find other synonyms, because there's this vocabulary mismatch um, problem where people with the answer to your question sometimes have the answer written in a different um, way than how you express your information need. And if we can expand the query to more closely match the uh, documents and answer it, then we can do a good job. So just kind of go through this quickly, but we just, we tried having people do query expansion. Is, is the, uh, <laughs> and then another thing that search results, uh, that, that search engines do is they do this post-processing uh, step. So we'll go out and fetch a ginormous pile of search results and then we do some post-processing, um, typically filtering, where we try to re-rank or remove <laughs> results that might not be relevant. And instead of doing this algorithmically, we went and tried to have people do the filtering for us as well. So you might have a bunch of search results and then you just ask people which ones aren't actually relevant to the query. They'd go knock them out and you'd be left with a subset of the results. And search engines are already doing this algorithmically. This is just having people go um, get involved. And we ran this on a bunch of different test corpora that we thought were particularly interesting for this problem. And we found that query expansion is generally ineffective. And this is because 
what you're trying to do when you're solving the vocabulary mismatch problem is not more accurately describe the person's information need. Instead, you're trying to get that information need to more closely match the corpus of documents that you're retrieving over. And that's hard to do without this really rich notion of the corpus, uh, the underlying corpus. And people generally don't have a good um, sense of that. The only people who do have done good job manually, um, so a lot of information retrieval problems are tested on the TREC corpus. And the only people who have done that well are people who are like very involved. Bruce Croft, I think, does a brilliant job of this because he's very involved in building that uh, TREC corpus and knows it really well. So he can do good query expansion because he knows what the retrieved documents are going to look like. Uh, query filtering can improve the quality just slightly, but kind of negligible for the amount of, for the cost, the, both the financial cost and the time cost. The one thing that we did see is it does improve robustness, so you're less likely to get really crazy things happening with the um, query filtering. So perhaps if you were in this high stakes kind of search it, where your results really mattered, it would be worth using. But otherwise. Um, this kind of sucked, and it seems like we need to be using people in new ways. Yeah? Uh, so how is quality calculated? Yeah, so we tested on um, known test corpora, and so quality was evaluated using precision and recall, based, using the kind of TREK quality. You know, this, this document's relevant. And that's been established by, um, yeah, the people at NIST go and do that. It's one of the interesting things about information retrieval in general that I think has been both its big success and its big challenge is that we have these um, kind of large established test corpora. So it allows people to really reproduce and try and do comparable metrics. Um, it also sort of narrows the scope of questions that you can be looking at. Um, and you'll see, I mean, that's why we went and the first thing we did was try and study something within this scope that we know how to do. And we couldn't do that much. And actually, this is sort of true in information retrieval algorithms in general. So we've sort of gotten, we're doing what we can on those corpora. And what we need to be doing now is thinking about new ways. Like, how do we really shake up the search experience and think about things differently? Um, so we started doing that. And this first example is not that interesting, but it just sort of fits the most neatly into the framework I was talking about, where you're doing some query processing some retrieval, and some result processing. But I'm going to show you some more crazy ones in just a minute. Um, so here we were thinking, OK, let's take um, really long queries. People do, people can understand long queries. Long queries are actually better. The long questions I ask you, you're going to give me a better answer. Search engines, the longer the query you give it, the worse it's going to do. And that's just the way that search engines are, unfortunately, at the moment. So if I have this long question where I want Italian restaurants in Bellevue or Kirkland with a gluten-free menu and it's a fairly sophisticated atmosphere, it's not going to do very well. And, and actually, if you add the word best, then you'll do terribly. I always, have you guys tried searching for best restaurants? That's a terrible query. <laughs> um, so we've got this long query, and we want to try and figure it out. So what we did was we said, OK, well, let's, you know, there's a lot of um, databases with information like this. This has got really um, kind of a lot of metadata about the restaurant that I'm looking at. We asked crowd workers to go and help us identify some of the metadata that's in the query, extract it. Some of that metadata we have fields for in the underlying database, and we can go and retrieve it, the results. And then um, we get a bunch of results from this database, and we go through them, and we want to try and help people understand the set of results and not just a single individual result. So we send crowd workers to each um, web page and ask them just to tick off whether it's gluten-free or takes a reservation or meets any of my particular criteria that I was working on. Um, and then we can show people something that's a little bit richer than just a standard list of results. Uh, and we ran this on complex restaurant queries. We used Yelp as our underlying corpus. And what we found was that um, query understanding improves the results and that people had a strong preference for the tabulated results. So what we're seeing is at, once we start using the crowd to do kind of richer kinds of understanding, we can get more interesting experiences for people. And some work we did with Michael is a good example of kind of going another step with this. Um, so in this work, we uh, to understand a query, we're using log analysis to try and identify uh, queries that need answers. So answers are becoming really popular um, in search results. Probably the biggest change that I've seen to the search experience um, in the 20 years that I've been working in this space is we're thinking about getting people directly to the, what they're looking for rather than getting them resources that will um, bring them what they're looking for. 
Um, so we tried to find these queries that need answers that we don't already have answers to. Uh, and the interesting thing here is, you know, most answers are generated by editorial, their editorial content. You know, if you want to go find what time your flight leaves, you can find that because somebody has actually manually went and created that. And we wanted to expand the kinds of answers down into the tail. Um, so we use log analysis to figure out whether a particular query needs answers, and we use the crowd to filter those queries to make sure we have ones that are right. We algorithmically use a search engine to retrieve a page that has the answer to that query, and then we use the crowd to extract answers. And so here's an example. You go search for dog temperature, and you can get a answer for the normal body temperature of the dog. That's not worth it to us at Bing to go actually create that content. Instead, uh, but we can pay a little bit of to the crowd workers, and they'll go create that for us. And a variant of this has actually gone um, is is now available via uh, Bing through a project called Distill, um, where people can get these. So here, this is me on Distill, acting as a as one of these sort of community member crowd workers. And the question is, why is the moon sometimes orange? And you can see below it a number of queries that people have run with this question, and then I go and write an answer about why the moon is sometimes orange, and uh, goes through a bunch of processes where people could then edit it and approve it and rate it, um, much like the kind of answers work uh, that Michael and I did. And then it ends up actually showing up to you if you were to search on Bing right now, but for moon orange, you would go and find the search result here. Um, so that's one way that you can start incorporating people to get new things. Um, another one that I like is actually thinking about taking search even outside of the uh, traditional search experience. So we know a bunch of people ask questions on Facebook or Twitter, but a lot of times, especially on Twitter, a lot of times we're just sort of talking to ourselves. Like I often am tweeting on Twitter and I don't think anybody's out there uh, seeing anything. So we created this Twitter bot that went around and looked for questions that people were already asking and then generated content for them on there. So here to understand the query, we're using the crowd to go through the Twitter feed and, and identify questions that people had. Uh, then the crowd would generate responses to these questions. So we're actually not using the, um, uh, the search engine in the middle. Crowd is generating a response and then getting um, people to vote on those answers. So for example, this person is asked, what type of iPhone case should I get? And their friend, Van Derry, went and gave a suggestion. Uh, but meanwhile, we asked the crowd, and the crowd came up with these otter boxes. Does anybody have an otter box? Does anybody know what I, you do? All right, that's great. <laughs> so suggest an otter box, and four out of 10 people suggested the otter box. Um, and we also got the crowd to vote on the answers that um, other people had given as well. Um, so cards are great, and we've seen that it helps enable these sort of interesting new experiences that you might not have thought about. But there's also challenges to working with crowd uh, workers instead of other, you know, including people in the processes. Uh, and that's, and, and you know, some of these are the obvious ones. Crowds are slow. We talked about that. Uh, crowds also cost money, um, but. I think perhaps more interestingly is the crowds are unknown to us. You know, they're unknown people. They don't know what we're interested in. They don't know what we know, how we understand things. And they, and they might have their own understanding of their own motivations. They don't know our motivations, but they might have their motivations. And their motivations might not always align with mine as well. You know, they might be motivated by other things. And so we went and tried to explore um, a couple different ways to work with the crowds to overcome these challenges. Uh, in this first example, we're thinking about um, the fact that the crowd doesn't know us and, and might not have the same preferences as us. If I ask the crowd for, you know, what's a great restaurant, if I ask Michael for a great restaurant, I know him, he knows me, he, I could trust his recommendation. If I go and ask a random person, I don't know as much about how I can trust that. Um, so we tried to explore here. Not restaurants, salt shakers. Michael, which salt shaker should I get? <laughs> the left one. Yeah, that looks good. Oh, and it's it's an like auto grind. It looks like a fancy one. Um, so we were looking at uh, the example of salt shakers. What's interesting about salt shakers is there's not a lot of databases um, with a lot of information about salt shakers. It's a hard thing to search for. Um, and we said, okay, let's try and get a crowd worker to choose a salt, a salt shaker for me. 
And one way to communicate my preferences about salt shakers might be to, um, to give them a bunch of salt shakers already with some of my preferences there. Right? This is how we do Netflix. You know, I liked this movie, I didn't like that movie. So here, I like these little Hawaiian kids kissing. Um, I dislike the one that Michael recommended. <laughs> and I like that, I kind of dislike that one too, right? And so then, what we go to card workers and we say, okay, this is some way for me to communicate. It's relevance feedback, which, by the way, is very hard to get in general. Um, we do an uh, okay job for Netflix because it helps with recommendations. You cannot collect relevance feedback on web search results. People won't give it to you. But I give you these examples and then I show you a new image. How many people think I'm going to like the grandparents kissing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, so this is, these are actually not my personal preferences, but um, because I liked the little, um, the little Hawaiian kids kissing, yes, I'm probably likely to like the uh, grandparents kissing as well. You can infer that from my preferences. So this is one way that we like to try to use card workers is try and represent a little bit about the person so you can make better future judgments. Another thing that we did was actually to try essentially using the crowd for collaborative filtering. So this is, would then start being exactly what Netflix does. We can get a bunch of people to give us a, their ratings <coughs> on these salt shakers and match, the, um, and then you can match me to the person who's most similar to me, uh, to my rating there. Um, and so this is sort of like on-demand collaborative filtering. It overcomes a lot of the cold start problems and the issues. So you can start all of a sudden doing this on your personal data collections or on these uh, data collections that have sparse uh, ratings as well, or fill-in ratings, um, to start doing things like Netflix would do. Um, so you, you can see this particular person who looks the most like me really likes the kissing grandparents as well, and uh, perhaps we can predict that I'm going to like the kissing grandparents. <laughs> um, and when we ran this here, you can see this is, we ran it on a bunch of different corpora, uh, different, different test sets. We ran it on the salt shaker test set. We also ran it on images of food. And here we can show for our baseline, for people guessing, and for using the, the rating collaborative filtering version, you can see the root mean square error. So lower is better in this case. First thing that jumps out is that pretty much having this personal crowd always produces lower root mean square, squared error. So that's a good thing. Trying to identify crowd workers who are good is useful. Um, but the, in, some, in some cases, the guessing's better, and sometimes the rating or a collaborative filtering approach is better. In general, we thought guessing had uh, advantages where it required fewer workers and uh, it was fun for people to do, but it was also hard to capture complex uh, preferences. So you can see it does a little bit worse in the food cases because it's much harder to say. It's easy to say you like kissing grandparents, you probably like the little kissing Hawaiian kids. It's much harder to say, oh, this person likes pad thai. That tells me anything about whether they're going to like fried chicken. Um, it's a little harder for us to generalize. Uh, rating was good because it requires a lot of workers to find, uh, uh, was, was a challenge because it required a, uh, many workers to find a good match. You had to find somebody who gave ratings that were similar to you. But it was easy to do, and also the data was reusable. All of a sudden now, if anybody else wants to look um, uh, at this, at the salt shakers, they can just look at the data we've already collected. Um, but one of the fun things about using crowd workers as opposed to um, a, a, a lot of the approaches that are used for collaborative filtering and other kinds of things like this is that you can start doing some pretty crazy kinds of tasks as well. So this is a task we ran where we wanted to look at handwriting imitation. So here we have our sample person. You know, I, I go and I write the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and I want to imitate this handwriting. Maybe I'm a kid and I want to uh, get a, my parents' note to get out of school the next day. Uh, um, we, so let's say the other thing that we want to write is wizard's hex. Don't, uh, this is because the grad student I was working with chose the term wizard's hex. I don't know what that means. Does that mean anything to anybody? No. <laughs> So anyway, they chose this particular term. And if we just ask people to randomly try writing wizard text, this is sort of the collaborative filtering thing, we find that about 17%, that the, the average random person gets mistaken for being written by that same person about 17% of the time. So not very often. Um, of course, the person who actually wrote the same thing as that text only gets mistaken for it being their text 83% of the time. I think that's probably because crowd workers are a little skeptical and don't always want to say. 
um, then it's relevant. So, you know, when we ask, if we ask random people, we have to ask about 13, 14 people before we're, you're 50% likely to be assumed um, to be the same person. So collaborative filtering is really hard. This is just a really rich space where there's a lot of uh, variation. We tried the guessing approach here instead, and that was uh, much better. Here, we get a pretty good approximation um, of the original text, better than 50%, when we uh, just have five people write the, um, write, try to imitate, so we show them this first sentence, ask them to try and imitate it and see what we can get. Uh, so here we have actually five people who tried to imitate this text, and one person who's the original writer. Can you guys guess which one is the uh, original writer? Somebody's guessed the bottom left. Other guesses? Oh, top, top, top middle. Top middle. This one? Top, top middle. Top middle. Top middle. middle. Yeah. Bottom right. Bottom right? <laughs> <laughs> we got all of these. Um, I, I always think it's this one. This is the one that it looks like to me. Uh, the actual answer, who, who said bottom left so fast? Uh, it's, it's not showing up that it's this, but it's actually the bottom left, um, which is really confusing too because clearly this person didn't try to imitate the Z, you know. Um, but so, so you get to do these fun little things with the crowd. Um, but there's also a bunch of challenges with working with the crowd. We can find people who are like you. But there's this concern that crowd workers might not always behave as um, scrupulously as we might want them to. Uh, you know, how many people, imagine if I were trying to use, uh, the, use the crowd for uh, search. How many people would be willing to share your queries with me for me to go play around with that? Anybody want to send me your queries? You would? <laughs> yeah. We have found it's easier to get people to share things like email, your own personal email history, than it is to get people to share their queries. Our queries are very personal, they're very private. We don't expect anybody to actually be seeing any of them. Um, and so, you know, uh, one concern is that the crowd, if it's working with our queries, might go and extract those queries and do something malicious with them. AOL, back in 2006, uh, right before SIG IR, went and reduced a large, uh, uh, went and made available a large corpus of queries to the research community with the idea of helping people do more research and understand our personalization and contextualization. And within a week, it was a front page news article on the New York Times that they had managed to de-anonymize de this corpus of queries and find people. I think um, the New York Times put a picture of this woman named Thelma Arnold who lives in Georgia on the front page because they had found her and her queries just by um, kind of going through the search logs. And uh, it was a big problem. So there's a, there is a real risk to having private data being extracted from crowd workers. Uh, the other threat is there's also a risk to manipulation the uh, search engine optimization uh, business in the US is a $30 billion uh, industry. It's huge. People spend a pile of money trying to get you to see the search results that they want you to see. Uh, search, search engine programming is really interesting because it's a very adversarial thing. People are always trying to convince you of something else. So if search engines, if people knew that what they said to you uh, through crowd work would influence the uh, search results that you saw, there'd be a lot of money and a lot of effort in trying to control what crowd workers actually went and told you. And so we ran a bunch of experiments where we wanted to try and get a sense for the risk of uh, kind of either having crowd workers extract information from your work you're doing or manipulate your interpretation uh, based on that. So. We ran a series of experiments where we tried to get crowd workers, we tried to see if we could pay crowd workers to either extract information or manipulate the results of crowd work. So um, the, the setup's a little bit complicated. I'm gonna take us through, through the details. We basically had two, two different, what looked like two different requesters post tasks uh, on online. The first task was a standard, this is a super typical crowd task where I say it's, it's um, you know, extraction of text from an image. So we show you this picture and we say, please write down the uh, text that's in this image. A person would go and write down the credit card number, for example. We then had a separate task, which I'm gonna call the attack task, where 
In this attack task, we asked somebody to go and complete the target task. So go do this other requester's task, complete it, and then come back and tell me what you what you gave, what information you gave to that other task. Okay? So we did this. How many people? So, so we gave this and, and then we measured the percentage of people who went and did that and came back. And what we found was when we gave them this particular picture and asked them to do this, we found that 62% of the people were willing to go and do this task and then tell us the text that they had given us. I should know this because I've read the paper before. What's the denominator? Is it people who like load the task, people who accept the task? Yes, I think it's people who accept the task. But I can, I... Yeah. I so more people might have looked at it and said, uh, and Yeah. Yeah, more people might have. We tried to, yes, we wanted to get people who were actually like engaged in it. Um, but then what's interesting is, you know, and, and what's interesting is not necessarily just the raw number here, although that's, that's perfectly interesting. It's also um, fun to go look at. So this is clearly a fake credit card, right? What happens if we give somebody something that looks like a real credit card? There we find that still one third of the people are willing to go and give us that information and put it down into our thing. So it's not as many. Here we had 60% of the people, but half of those people who were willing to give us it were still willing to do it even if it looked like uh, an actual credit card. We also looked at um, task manipulation and seeing whether we could get people to give the wrong answer to a task that they were doing. So what do you guys think this word says? Sun. Fun, Fun, sun. Gun. 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 Yeah, so those are, those are the three most common things. Uh, we just gave this just to get a baseline. We gave it to people um, just to figure out what people were seeing. Gun was the most common. Fun was the second most common. You, it, you got it right again. <laughs> so it actually is fun. And then... Uh, <laughs> you'd make a lovely crowd worker. <laughs> Oh, and then uh, sun gets a uh, 12%. And so here, what we did for our attack task is we said, go please and enter the term sun there. So, you know, it's a, it's a reliable one. Only 12% of the people entered it without any prompting, but it seems like it's a possible thing. And we found when we did this that people entered sun 75% uh, of the time which is much higher than the 12% of the time that we saw as our baseline. Um, and one thing here is you might just have a priming effect. You know, I, if I told you, all right, we're going to look at something and, it's, and it says sun, and then I showed you this, you might be like, oh, yeah, that says sun. I buy it. Um, so we actually went and took a piece of text that looked very different. Uh, here we asked them to enter the word sun for the word length. And here we found that 28% of the people were still willing to say that it was sun. And this is kind of consistent with what we saw on the other side. We see generally that about a third of the people are kind of mercenary and willing to do things as long as you pay them. And about a third of the people won't be, do these tasks that seem questionable. And then there's about a third of the people in the middle ground that will sort of conditionally uh, do things that are questionable. And uh, here's, here's another way that you can see this. Um, so the, it, it also depends on the uh, payment that we give a person for a task. So we, the, the attack task, for most of the time we were paying, um, we paid five cents for all these tasks in most of our experience. But then we said, okay, what if we pay the attacker a little bit more money? You know, what if we pay you 10 cents or 25 cents or 50 cents? And we found that this third of people who were sort of conditionally motivated, who wouldn't do the task if we just paid five cents, they would if we said 45, if we paid 45 cents more. So if you're curious about the price of your soul, it's 45 cents. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, yes. Don't you also want to compare that to the price that was paid for the for the other task? For the target task, yes. yes, you do actually. So that's a good setup for the very next little line here. So there we see the target task. We were paying five cents in every case. Uh, in the target task, we we paid. Uh, we also tried paying twenty five cents, and then we were able to neglect to negate that. And so you actually, and that's less money. But if the target's paying more, and we played around too with phrasing. There's, so this has led to all sorts of interesting questions about how you can try and protect yourself from this sort of uh, conditionally malicious third. Um, and, you know, payment, phrasing, 
putting like eyeballs at the top of it, all these sorts of things can help you um, help you get keep the keep this down to the thirty percent rather than going higher. So, so was something that was paid for both the target and the yes. I see. Yeah, they look like two separate requesters, so everybody just paid and did exactly what they were supposed to do. Um, yeah. Um, so that's a little bit about using the crowd, and there's sort of these costs and there's these risks. Friends help um, mitigate a lot of this in that mostly we trust our friends. I'm, uh, we might be more embarrassed to show our friends our queries than, than random crowd workers, um, but we trust them. And they don't cost any money. They cost some social capital to involve, um, but they don't cost any money. So we've also looked at using friends as a resource during the search process. And we've done a ton of this. I'm just going to kind of jump through some of this pretty quickly to highlight some of the most fun aspects. One of the um, things we did was we actually wanted to compare what's it like to search versus ask your friends for information. And you, I encourage you to try this once we're done. Think of a big search task that you have to do. Okay, and then sit down and post a question about that to your social network. So go on Facebook and like, let's say you want to, I think that one example we have was somebody wanted to uh, retile their kitchen backsplash. So go online and say, uh, help me figure out how to retile my kitchen backsplash and then go post it and then go search. And so we had people do this and we let them search for however long they wanted to until they felt like they were done. Uh, one thing that's interesting is first of all, Posting this question, people on average posted, I think, a 75 um, letter character question, and um, which is half the length of a tweet, but it took them about five minutes to compose that question, because we think very carefully about what we say to our social network and how do we, how we ask that. On the other hand, their queries, they would spend like a fraction of a second coming up with. They just sort of spit out anything that they weren't. And so people went, but these were, but still they did very long involved search sessions. They probably spent about a half hour on average. Uh, searching, and then whenever they were, whenever they felt like they were done searching, they'd learned about how to retile their kitchen backsplash. They went to Facebook and they looked at the um, answers that they got. And what we found was that actually, as much as we think of searching as faster than asking our social networks, in over half of the cases, people's friends gave them an answer before they were done searching, and pretty much everybody got an answer by the end of the day. Some of these answers confirmed findings, the things that they had found, but I think what was particularly interesting is a lot of the information they got from their social network was actually complementary. So we saw people provided information that was not available online. So somebody was going to New Zealand and wanted to learn about you know, what they should do while in, while in New Zealand, and somebody offered, said, oh, you should come stay on our couch while we're there, and you wouldn't have gotten that offer to sort of couch surf. Uh, if, if you were, um, another person typed up, was looking for um, vegan recipes, and one of their friends typed up their grandmother's handwritten vegan recipe and shared it with them. So that was a transfer of information that was not previously online. Uh, another one, you also saw social content. People were like, oh, that's great, you're going to New Zealand, have fun. Uh, and then we also saw people do, get information that they hadn't actively sought. So search engines can only give you things that you're searching for. Whereas your friends think a little bit more broadly and can give you uh, more unexpected content. So for example, somebody was asking, they said, oh, I just got this new um, program management certification and I want to know how to make use of it. Like, how should I use it to, to grow in my job at my company? And one of the friends is like, oh, you shouldn't grow in your job at your company. You should quit and become a consultant. And they really liked that as a potential response because it wasn't something that they had uh, thought about before. Um, so we see that there are these complementary values to using your um, social network and, uh, and search. We wanted to get an idea of how we could, we looked at shaping how the replies that crowds give us. We suspected there would, it would also be possible to shape the kinds of answers that our friends give us. And so we ran this experiment. This is a pretty fun um, kind of setup for an experiment. What we did was we asked hundreds of people to all post exactly the same question to Facebook. So I might have all of you, everybody in this room, go and the question we uh, posted about was, was um, something that we thought anybody could sort of get away with asking. We had the question, should I watch the movie E.T.? So should I watch E.T.? So I might have all of you post that question to your social network. And then I could look at things. Like I might say, all right, everybody on this side of the room should post a question in the morning. And everybody on this side of the room should post a question in the evening. And I can look at the differences between having a questions 
asked in the morning and the evening. Or I might look at just the men in the room versus the answers that the women in the room get. And then we did some small, simple manipulations also in the language that was used for asking this question. And so this is actually one, one takeaway that you might be able to go use for yourself when you have uh, questions to ask. So we looked at asking a question with a question mark at the end versus not having a question mark on the question, so just leaving that off. Uh, we also looked at, we noticed about a third of the queries, a third of the questions that people ask on Facebook or on Twitter, and you can, you'll can you notice this now that you've heard it, about a third of the questions actually are directed, at a, targeted at a specific group of people. Most commonly, anyone. People will say, does anyone know where I should eat in Palo Alto tonight? Or I might say, do my Bay Area friends know where I should eat in Palo Alto tonight? And that's a significant portion of um, the questions people ask, so we also tried that, and we said, we said, does anyone think I should watch E.T. tonight? And so, so maybe this half would say, does anyone think I should watch E.T.? We also asked our movie buff friends, so do my movie buff friends think I should watch E.T.? And then we also had um, just the standard, should I watch E.T. tonight? Um, and then we also played around with the length, adding a couple extra words to make the question a little bit longer. And then we went and measured the replies. We measured the number of replies, the quality of the replies, the speed of the replies that people got as a function of both the question phrasing and who was asking the question and when they asked the question. Uh, a lot of the things that we found weren't that surprising. Uh, we found that larger networks provide better replies. So if, if you have a lot of friends, you're going to get more, you're more likely to get an answer. That seems obvious. Uh, we found that you get faster replies in the morning, but more replies in the evening. I think that kind of makes sense in the morning. We tend to be a little bit more like up and at them. If you see a question, you're going to answer it, you're going to do it, but you're not screwing around as much. Whereas in the evening, more people are screwing around um, and willing to, to reply. Uh, my favorite piece was looking at the question phrasing and seeing how, how to ask the question. So we saw that it's best to include a question mark and that it's best to target a question at a group, even anyone. Um, and that you want to be brief because adding additional context. Um, so if you want to ask a question, you should say, does anyone know what restaurant I should eat at in Palo Alto tonight? Uh, with a question mark. Um, we also found that early replies shape future replies. You see this sometimes if somebody says, oh, guess what? I just had a baby. If the first reply says congratulations, everybody else is going to go and say congratulations afterwards. Whereas if the first reply says, welcome to the world, little baby, then all the other replies will say, welcome to the world. So you see actually common, uh, common language here. Somebody provides a link in the first reply. Other people are going to go give more links. And it seems like there's this really interesting opportunity for friends and algorithms to collaborate to find the best content. Uh, I have a whole other section that I'm going to skip and just give a little bit of a preview on uh, thinking about self-sourcing, and this is including the individual in their own search tasks as well. Um, you know, because the truth is when you think about when we're talking about uh, slow search, it's not just about trying to get a person to the end of the search experience. We've actually found that people learn a lot during the course of a search. Our vocabulary changes that we're using in our queries develop. So for example, if you start out searching for high blood pressure, along the way you might change that the queries that you're running to be something like hypertension. The websites we visit, the resources we use, the diversity of resources that we look at, they all change as we're searching. And um, it's really important not just to think of search as a sort of end goal that you're getting at, but rather think about it as a, as a process um, to getting there. But I'll save that for a later day. <laughs> um, oh, this is this is actually just real quickly because I think this is fun <coughs> as a little um, as a little side piece. Is um, one thing that we've found is is just to go back one. Um, when you think about, you know, I talked about how people don't provide relevance feedback as they're searching, but you do provide implicit signals as you're searching that provide inf people with information. So if I ran this query, which is a long query, and therefore very likely to screw up and get me bad results, which it does, you know, I want interested in IR research related to using additional time in search, and I might get a bunch of crap back and click on one of those search results to go explore further. The search engine then has a signal about what I'm interested in, can use that to go try and identify other information and show it, show it back to me. The challenge is, however, that changing the search results to give me that content can be really disruptive. 
Um, I don't know if people remember dynamic menus. A lot of you guys are pretty young, so you might not remember this, but Microsoft used to go and try and change the ordering of the menu items to bring what you were looking for up to the top. So in this example, if perhaps I use this, um, this page color item a lot, Microsoft would go and put it at the very top of the list um, so that I would get to it faster. And that proved to be a total disaster because you'd be coming here and you'd be like, where is page color? And you can't find it and it's up in the top. It's not where you're expecting it, even though it's up higher and easier to find. Um, and we find the same thing with search results. If you change the ordering of a search result, it screws the things up for you and you're less likely to find what you're looking for as well. And so we've done a lot of things trying to, and this is Michael mentioned a little bit about change blindness. We've done a lot of work trying to help um, people uh, find things. And what we found was that you really want to bias your presentation um, by expectation. So if I clicked on this search result, I'm not going to expect to see new content up, up above, but I might expect to find new content that's interesting right below where I clicked. Um, so what we've, uh, so kind of in summary, we've looked at allowing, how allowing additional time helps us um, helps create interesting opportunities and enables us to start thinking about how we can incorporate slow resources and, and in particular people into the search. Uh, we focused on crowdsourcing and trying to use the crowd to Wizard of Oz, some really interesting new uh, slow search experiences. Um, and we found that the crowd's not useful as kind of component replacements, but can be useful for, for um, these bigger changes, but that there are risks and challenges to working with a crowd, some of which are mitigated by our friends, and that friends provide valuable and complementary information to what we're looking for, and that we can also kind of manipulate the kinds of responses that our friends get as well. And so I think there's a really interesting opportunity to think about how other people, like our friends or the crowd, can work together with algorithms to create new interesting content uh, and support the search process. So I'm really excited about seeing where slow search goes. And if you're interested in more, here's a bunch of places where you can go dig up um, additional, additional content, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. We've got time for just a couple questions here. <coughs> Slow questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in that particular example of like, I'm looking for a uh, like Italian restaurant, gluten free menu, um, something else. Um, that one, um, that that class of problems, like, isn't that kind of like, um, couldn't that be done like algorithmically with like semantic like parsing and uh, like um, stuff like like? Is that specifically like an example of like something that actually requires? like slow search as opposed to just algorithm implementations? Yeah, so, I, I mean, it's a good question and I think this is sort of, this is one of the really interesting things about trying to break the process down and get people involved in various components is what we're able to automate and do is, is continually increasing. Um, in many cases, so search engines do try to parse and do and use natural language processing and other approaches to try and, um, try and parse out and understand things. Um, it doesn't do very well on the edge cases um, a lot of times, and, and we're continually getting closer. And one of the things that I particularly like is when you start doing that sort of thing, you collect also really awesome training data that you can then feed back into the algorithms. Um, and so one area that we're doing a lot of work in right now we call hybrid intelligence, which is sort of this hybrid of human intelligence and machine intelligence where you collect data uh, by having basically you start out with people wizard of ozing things and then you start pulling the people out as you collect enough data to do it instead. So, yeah. I've got yeah. So I'm wondering if the framing could shift in the sense of not being slow in returning results to me but becoming something where it becomes sort of like a regret engine where it realizes that like, well, couldn't help Michael, but like they're, you know, if it happened to Michael, high probability it's going to happen to someone else later. So maybe instead of trying to say like, what are times where Michael's willing to take a long time to search? What are the opportunities to essentially use that with people running into the wall to like fix it before the next person comes yeah. along? 
Well, so that's a great question. I think the big challenge there is figuring out where Michael screwed up so that we can help the next person. Uh, because 50% of the queries that a search engine sees every day are new queries that they've never seen before. So it's not easy to really say, oh, Michael had a miserable experience searching for this particular random query because nobody's ever going to search for it again. So the important part is to figure out what's generalizable about Michael's negative experience and how we can improve on that. Um, you can see with Distill, so like Distill even, you know, which is this instance where we were trying to create kind of community generated answers for search results, that um, did a, uh, we, we, we really tried to expand it and figure out what other kinds of queries and one of the pieces of that is figuring out what queries does this search result work for because maybe nobody's ever going to ask again why is the moon orange but somebody might search for orange moon or you know those sort of things red moon a lot of these goals seem like things where if you could do them faster you could and maybe in the near future you will be able to do them just as fast but some of them were also things where by the nature of them being slow they were things that you want that you want to pursue. So what are some other things like that where it's actually because they're slow that's why it's better rather than things that could just be sped up? Yeah, so I think a lot of the things could could just be sped up and this is just a way of getting there because we don't yet have perfect intelligence. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with accessing resources and things that change. So one, accessing people are an inherently slow resource. I think also crawling new databases or collecting new information. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be people, but I might want to, um, you know, the content's changing. What's the latest on Twitter? Maybe I think, maybe I think I'm going to learn about what happened to Prince if you can wait a few minutes because that information isn't even available. And so I have to go out and crawl that information and, and process it and think about it. Everything else we can pretty much just, you know, if it's about thinking about information, you can think about doing it faster and better. Um, really has to be something that's not yet available to, to be inherently slow. Um, but I think it's a good question, and I think there's certainly different, um, different time constraints on different things. All right, everyone slow clap. <laughs>to sort of, um, you know, publish soon or meet the next deadline. Slow science advocates that, uh, advocates say we should be thinking more about what's, what's going to impact the world five years or ten years or even longer down the line, even if that comes at the expense of short-term uh, productivity. Uh, so slow search builds on the ideas behind these various slow movements. And there's a handful of ways that you could imagine including time into the search process. One is to help the searcher slow down and think a little bit about what they're doing as they, as they search. So maybe you learn as you're searching. Maybe you encounter serendipitous information as you're searching. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but I'm actually going to focus on a second aspect of slow search in this talk today. And that's thinking about algorithmically, what might we do if we had more time to produce search results uh, for people? Uh, because search engines haven't ever really done this. Instead, what search engines do is they're focused on getting search results to people as fast as humanly possible. And there's a really good reason for that. Uh, study after study has shown that when people get search results just a little bit slower, they think that they're a lot worse. Uh, so both, uh, both our research at Bing and uh, research that's been done at Google, um, there's even some more obvious changes that you might have seen. Um, how many people know that Google changed their logo recently? Yeah, do you like the new logo better? Yeah, it's ugly, right? <laughs> but you know what's good about it? It's made entirely out of vectors. It loads really fast. It's a lot smaller than the old logo. And so their search result page will load that much faster, even you know, 50 milliseconds faster in your experience searching. You'll think that Google actually has better search results. Uh, even changes that are designed um, that seem sort of unambiguously good end up being bad if they slow down your search experience. So um, another example, this is another one by Google, is they actually ran this experiment where they decided to give people 20 search results instead of 10 search results in response to a query. 
And this makes kind of logical sense when you think about the fact that nobody ever clicks on the second search result page. Nobody ever, ever, ever clicks on the like next search result page. And you know, that's a shame because when you look at the relevance of search results, the first couple search results tends to be like those results ranked one or two are very likely to be relevant. But by the time you're getting to like the fifth result, it's still likely to be relevant, but the fifth result and the 15th result are about the same likeliness of being relevant. So there's lots of good relevant content on that second page that you don't ever see because you're not clicking on that in a context to understand uh, what people are looking for when, when they give a short two or three word query. And uh, that led to a whole area of research within personalized search. Um, actually developed the first algorithm that Bing uses to personalize search results. But what became evident as we were doing that is that our, um, much more than just an individual query in search results, people are thinking a lot more about uh, large complex tasks. And that's where slow search comes in, trying to think about how to support these more complex tasks. Uh, slow search builds on a series of slow movements. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the slow food movement that advocates for taking more time to prepare and enjoy food so that you connect more with what you're consuming. But there's actually other slow movements that I think are pretty fun too. Uh, one is the slow parenting movement. And uh, the idea behind the slow parenting movement is that we're not trying to raise our children just to be grown-ups as uh, fast as possible, but instead we should step back and think a little bit about uh, you know, just capturing and enjoying childhood for what it is and not for where you're going. Um, and I talk about slow parenting partly as an excuse to show my four cute boys. <laughs> uh, another slow movement that I think is pretty interesting is the slow science movement. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with the So thank you much, uh, very much for coming here. I do apologize for those of you who saw that the title of the talk was Slow Search and thought, oh good, I have to go there because Jamie's going to tell me about how to make search faster. Because as Michael mentioned, I'm not here to actually get rid of Slow Search. I'm here to advocate on behalf of it. So in the 20 years that I've been trying to study and understand and support search, slow and search are never used together in a positive way. Um, and I, uh, but really a lot of the things that kind of what I've been looking at as I study how people interact with external information resources to find things has shown that search is a really fascinating, rich, and complex process. So for example, uh, your two or three word query that you typically give to a search engine isn't nearly enough to express what uh, most information needs. Maybe if you're looking for Facebook, it's enough, but if you want to understand a medical condition or if you want to plan a vacation, um, it's just too little. So I started out thinking a fair amount about how we can use Cull has shown that if you slow search results by even just a couple hundred milliseconds, you're going to decrease the experience that people have. Um, so the way that we run these experiments is we'll take a query that you've issued. And normally, when a search engine gets a query, it races as fast as it can to throw the search results back out at people. Uh, in these experiments, what we did instead is we get your query, and then we hold on to it for a fraction of a second. So we might hold on to your query for 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, and then we'll give you your search results, the same search results that we would give you if we didn't hold on to it. And even though people can't actually notice a couple hundred milliseconds, it's basically imperceptible to people. When we do that, the people with their search results will go and interact less with the search results. They click fewer results. They abandon their query more. They issue fewer queries. And, and those changes actually persist over time. So we see that even if we stop holding on to your search results by a couple hundred milliseconds, next week you're searching less. So there's this real strong incentive to getting people results as fast as possible. And search engines invest a ton of resources and a ton of effort and a ton of time into doing that. Uh, one example is we uh, assume term independence so that we don't have to think of all of the different possible ways uh, that content relates to each other. We also do a lot of, invest a lot in caching uh, 